Today's feast seems almost like an appendix, an afterthought to the solemn liturgy of Holy Thursday. And it is a feast that solemnizes what we believe in every liturgy. The feast originated in the 13th century because of the visions of a nun, Sister Juliana of Mount Cornelion. It was celebrated first as a local feast, but extended to the whole church by Pope Urban in 1264. I find it interesting that this great feast originated in the insights and teaching of a woman in the Middle Ages. I hope that continues to happen. It was primarily a profession, professional feast, which quickly spread throughout the whole Christian world. The Eucharist was carried throughout a town or village, and the processions became a teaching tool of the whole course of salvation history. But the procession was by ordinary people who followed the enshrined host, often carrying symbols of their trade or craft, and it recalls our procession through life and reminds us that the Eucharist is our food for our everyday journey of life. The risen Christ present in the Eucharist and in the church in this procession accompanied people throughout their ordinary lives. In many parts of the world, this feast is still celebrated with traditional rituals involving music and dance. The first reading and the gospel both remind us that the Eucharist which we celebrate is a covenant. Every, most of the people here have celebrated a covenant. It's called marriage. A covenant and his agreement between two people <coughs> of sharing gifts, lives, important things. So that Moses in the Old Testament sprinkles half the blood of a sacrificial animal on the altar, the other half on the people. The blood signifies as the life force that seals the covenant between the Holy God and Israel. Not only are God and the people bound together irrevocably, but the people themselves are united to one another. This covenant, which comes at the end of the book of Exodus, is, describes the ways that the people are to live and act. They were brought out of Egypt out of oppression, but they had to learn how to live as a liberated people. They were liberated from slavery, but for freedom. This covenant describes the way they are to live and act. Especially, they should remember that they are people freed from oppression in Egypt and freed to become a people who in one of the most solemn formulas of the covenant are to care for the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the stranger in the land. The gospel reminds us of what we celebrate every Sunday and not simply on today's feast. What Jesus says and does at the Last Supper is really the culmination of an entire life of his poured out in love. Jesus, flesh and blood, sustains, protects, and frees us as a people who then embody for others his same unbreakable commitment of love. His blood seals the covenant for all people. As Sister Mary said, I would add here again that the translation poured out for many which was mandated among the host of poor translations in the revised 2011 liturgy. It's not only inaccurate, but I noticed that Pope Francis says, for all. 
But on this Feast of the Body and Blood of Christ today, June 3rd, 2018, I find the reading from St. Paul captures the deepest meaning of our time here together. Today's reading from Paul in Corinthians 12 follows a discussion of the Lord's Supper in Corinthians 11, where he castigates the community because the rich members, as he says, when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and the other becomes drunk. And Paul says, and thus you humiliate the have-nots among you. At that time, what we would call the Mass, the words of institution, were said after a Eucharistic or a feast, a agape, a feast of unity where people shared their food. But they weren't doing that at Carmes. The uh, people who were well off sort of went to Wegmans and brought a very good meal. <laughs> the others stopped at Taco Bell. <laughs> and that made the Taco Bell crowd feel downtrodden, humiliated. So when Paul says this, though, he makes an incredible statement. It is not the Lord's Supper you are eating. Whatever you think it is when you say these words, it wasn't what Jesus intended. Jesus intended the meal to be a sign of self-sacrificing love. Then in the second reading from Romans of Corinthians 12, he goes on to describe what the community should be. It is to be composed of different gifts and different ministries. All of these are activated uh, by the same Spirit, who gives each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. Uh, as you read through the whole text, part of this, he has a whole list of gifts. One of them is even administration, which keeps in mind Judy and uh, uh, Connie and uh, all the prioresses of the community. Jesuit superiors are left out. <laughs> he then compares the community to a human body and says that in the human body, every part needs every other part. The parts are so interdependent, he says, if one member of the body suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice with it. And he concludes with what, for me, in my uh, ministry, has been a guiding text. You are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. This is truly one of my favorite New Testament texts. When I give out the Eucharist and I say, the body of Christ, I realize that I'm holding the body that was given up on the cross that we might be free. I also realize that standing before me here at Carmel is also the body of Christ in all its beautiful diversity and individuality. I have felt this for years, but it came home to me in a startling new way last week when I watched the striking movie, Pope Francis a man of his word. It was at the Charles, and unfortunately only for a week or so. The film is a stunning pageant of images and words. It unfolds as if the Pope was reviewing all humanity as his parish. Francis' face is the window to his heart, and in the movie reflects different Deep joy, you can see his face light up, as exciting children and young of old of all races and nations press upon him. With an expression of a disappointed schoolteacher, looking somewhat harsh, he warns the phalanx, phalanx of scarlet-robed cardinals <laughs> to steer clear of worldliness and ambition. The camera then 
pants to their faces. <laughs> they all look like their shoes are on too tight. <laughs> Another scene occurs, and we see a dark cloud of horror covering the face of Francis as he looks upon African refugees hurling themselves into the sea of crowded boats. Loving compassion sculpts his features as he washes the feet of a Muslim woman holding her baby. The film is so powerful, I would use it for a class, I would use it for prayer, I would use it for a retreat, because it alternates between pictures of Pope Francis, and it's, uh, the camera work is outstanding, and then pictures of the react the different groups that he talks to. In the film also, not simply his face, but Francis' words ring with power and truth when he warns the United Nations in New York, quote, the misuse and destruction of the environment are also accompanied by a relentless process of exclusion. In effect, he says, a selfish and boundless thirst for power and material prosperity leads both to the misuse of available natural resources and to the exclusion of the weak and the disadvantaged. In another address, when he was in the United States, he talked to both houses of Congress and he quoted the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then he stated, the rule points us in a clear direction. Quote, let us treat others with the same passion and compassion with which we want to be treated. Let us seek for others the same possibilities which we seek for ourselves. Let us help others to grow in love as we would like to be helped ourselves. In a word, if we want security, let us give security. If we want life, let us give life. If we want opportunities, let us provide opportunities. The yardstick we use for others will be the yardstick which time will use for us. If thunderous applause the politician sat down and he remained so, ignoring the major challenges of his address. As I sat there in the theater, in silent gratitude that God has given Francis as a gift to a broken world, I heard, watching the film, Francis say himself this quote from St. Paul. If one person suffers, all suffer. I have been thinking of this text all week while preparing this homily, but realized that Pope Francis raised Paul's vision of Christian community to the community of all humanity. It is not simply a Christian community that is one body. You are members of the body of Christ. He sees the broken body of Christ in every suffering person, regardless of their religion, belief, or lack of it, as Sister Mary said so eloquently. He believes that as one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. The film is somewhat sobering, but the final picture you see of Pope Francis is a beautiful smile. Amid the worldwide footage of conflict, he sows constantly genuine seeds of hope. And he once said, I think describing himself, a smile is the flower of a heart. When I hold the body of Christ before you at communion time, I think also of the words of Edith Stein, 
Now, Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Saint Sister Benedicta of the Cross. Who, looking upon the host, saw, she said, a disk of whiteness kneaded with sheer silence. The divine heart which beats so mysteriously for all humanity. The divine heart which beats so mysteriously for all humanity. And then she added, then I am no longer that which I was before. Our world and our church, I feel, faces horrors and challenges worse than at any time in recent history. As we, the body of Christ today, receive the body of Christ, let us pray and work that as a people and nation, we will no longer be that which we are now.